So the guitar only has three strings. It's a small size guitar. Everything is in one key and everything is um, marked up with, with, with decals and colors. And they learn how to read standard notation, but it's all with colors. And they only have to learn seven notes. And everything's unison playing. And so it's very simple. It's almost shockingly simple, but it needs to be that way. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. G'day everyone, and welcome back to Season 1, 2018 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to Episode number 117, that's Series 1, Season 1 I should say, Episode 1 of 2018. And if you're one of my Inner Circle Piano Teaching Community members, a very special welcome to you. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show, and if this is your first time here, then thank you so much for tuning in. I really do hope that you enjoy the conversation that we have today, and uh, that you of course go and tell all your piano teaching friends about it. For those of you who have been listening for a while, thanks again for choosing to spend time with me. I certainly don't take for granted that you're all very busy people and have lots of other things you could be listening to. So thanks again for tuning in. The Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, of course, is the place where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas, business and teaching strategies to help support your teaching and grow your studio. Today's show notes and full transcript are available as usual if you head to timtopham.com slash episode 117. We're kicking off season one, 2018, with a very special guest talking about creating preschool music programs. And I know that many teachers uh, are interested in teaching younger students, younger than the sort of average start of, starting age of probably seven or eight, uh, but perhaps don't know where to go. And there are a number of courses that you can uh, purchase uh, or license, uh, but today's uh, guest has actually built his own and he's actually going to share some of the ideas and strategies around how he did that in case that is something that interests you as well. My guest today is a music school owner who used to turn away four to six year olds who wanted to learn how to play an instrument in his studio. This inspired him to develop and license rock band programs that allow a whole new age group to participate in the ensemble experience and of course feed into his the rest of his uh, studio offerings. So Dave Simon, welcome to the show. Hey, well, uh, thank you. And thank you for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. I've been uh, following what you've been up to online for a little while now. So it's good to finally meet and have a proper chat and also share some ideas with some other teachers. You're doing some great things. Thank you. Now, before we uh, jump in today, uh, let's get a little bit of context to what you're actually up to these days. Where are you based? How many students are you looking after? What instruments are being taught? Those kinds of things. So I'm uh, based in St. Louis, Missouri, here in the States. And I have 260 students. I've been around for 14 years. Um, my whole school was, was launched on this whole idea of, of group programming, mm -hmm. which um, has really paid off well over the years. And what's your instrument? You know, no one ever guesses this, but I'm, I'm a bass player. Oh, all right. I thought you might have been a drummer, actually. Oh, okay. Well, usually you know, people think guitar, piano. Um, I, I like drummers. The drummers are very cool, so I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm a bass player, and um, we to answer your other question. You know, we, we teach guitar, drums, piano, bass, and voice, kind of everything that you would find in, in in a rock band. Right. Okay. So all in one studio location with multiple rooms. Correct. Therefore, yep. Great. Right. So we, we've got lots of people listening who I know are thinking about expanding their studio in the future by potentially hiring other teachers, offering summer camps, um, potentially expanding to other locations. So I'd like to find out a little bit more about your own growth journey. So can you take us back to when you first started teaching? Did you begin as a base teacher one-on-one -on -one in a room with students? And then how did you then decide it was time to go, oh, actually, I need a piano teacher now. And then um, let's do some drums as well. Yeah, I, I did, you know, start like that. I was, um, you know, in, in the early 90s, I was living in New York City teaching bass guitar out of my apartment, which in 2018, that probably wouldn't go over so well. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I had about 10 students and I you know, was teaching for a while and then I hit 30 and decided, okay, I'm like done 
with music. I got to get a real job. I got a real job. And um, I really, it, it just kept, you know, nagging at me that I was, was out of music. And so I came up with this idea of, you know, starting a, a school that was focused on rock bands. This is uh, prior to School of Rock coming out. So it really was just an experiment. So I'd been out of teaching for, uh, you know, maybe five or eight years. And um, I started with six kids in my school. And then it just got to a point where I had enough where I had to decide whether it's time to quit my job or and pursue the school or, or quit the school. And I, I, I went for it. And here I am 14 years later. Wow. So you actually stopped teaching for a while and did another yeah. full-time job. What was your other full-time job? Um, I got into IT. I was living um, in San Francisco at that point during the whole IT and internet explosion in around 2000, and there was so much work to be had, and um, it was pretty tempting. But I also realized, you know, once you're a musician, it's a hard thing to to, to actually let go of. Right. And so you decided to. What was the little trigger that made you start again with those six kids? So here's what's funny is that I went to a career counselor and I did this whole like process of questions and it was like a, I don't know, maybe like a 16 hour process. And at the very end, she said, well, I've concluded that you need to go into music education. I'm like, <laughs> that's exactly what I'm trying to get out of. Uh, uh, interesting. But, but, you know, to really to, to be, be dig in a little bit deeper, I grew up or in college, I was a jazz studies major. And what I loved about that was that we had a combo leader who wasn't, you know, playing with us and had all his ears and attention on the group. I was also a rock and roller at the time. And I felt like that as a rock and roller, it would be so beneficial to have an older, more experienced person kind of playing that role of a conductor or a leader. And that doesn't exist in the rock world. Hmm. And so I thought, well, maybe I could just put something together where young kids are working with me and I can be their their mentor because I had that in jazz. I had it in classical, but in rock and roll, it's just you and your buddies in a garage. Right. And where did you start with those six kids? Uh, I just rented a basement of a music store. Right. Okay. And and how did you find those kids originally? I, I walked around town and just put up posters and said, open house, Dave Simon's Rock School. And I had no idea what that was going to even mean. Um <laughs> So people showed up, you know, about 10 people showed up to the open house and um, I signed up six and then, a, you know, away I went. And about a year, a year later, I had 65 kids. The movie School of Rock came out, which was a huge, you know, uh, game changer for me. And um, I noticed you mentioned that before. Uh, that, that did actually have an impact, did it? Well, I went, the minute I heard about it, I emailed all the local media and said, hey, we've got our own school of rock here in St. Louis. Kind of ah, pitched it. Clever, yeah. Right. And so, I mean, this, I mean, this was like a great moment. I, um, I quit my corporate job. I had my, you know, maybe 10, 15 students, and I was waiting tables again. You know, here I was in like my mid to late 30s waiting tables, and my um, boss comes to me and holds up the cover of the local newspaper with my picture on it. <laughs> and he's like, so when are you giving me my two weeks notice? Uh, and about three days later, I gave her my two week notice because I started, you know, everybody was calling. They wanted to be a part of this, you know, rock school thing. Wow. That, that's some uh, clever PR and some, uh, some lucky timing too, I guess. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so when when it came to so you you had these six kids so sorry let's just go back the open house um, mm. just to get the language right that that's like where you just say hey anyone come along and we're going to jam and you can have a look at the what I'm doing sort of thing for free no so I had well I had an open house and I just shared my, my vision of um, what I wanted the school to be and okay. at that point I was going to be the teacher. Yeah, and because I was, I was the only only employee, and that was and a free so, event that any parent or child could come along to. Right, but there was no playing, and I knew nothing about business, and I have this very vivid memory of the people there waving, like kind of holding up their checkbooks, going, "How much is it?" Oh, and wow. I hadn't even I hadn't even thought about that. 
Wow, and so I just made up a price right on the spot. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so those that core of six, uh, so they were kids. What kind of age were those kids? Uh, you know, early teens, late teens. Yeah. I mean, I'm great. sorry, early teens, kind of preteen as well. Yep. So they signed up, and you began teaching weekly group rock classes with all of them on different instruments in one room. Right. And then I would drive to their houses for their private lessons. Wow. Okay. So each week they would have one group class jamming together in the room with you conducting effectively, and then you'd go to their house as well. Right. Once I got to like, you know, eight or so kids, I split them into two groups and I just kept building more and more groups. And um, for an additional price, I would come to their home. Right. Okay. And, um, now, what was nice is that the music school, I'm sorry, the music store had people renting rooms that were teaching lessons. So I was getting a lot of their students. So I didn't, so a lot of them were still staying with their private instructors. So it really worked out well. Oh, okay. So above you in the main music school right. or wherever that was, there was kids having private lessons who were hearing some cool music going on in the basement and going, well, hey, maybe I could join in that. Right. 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 Wow, yeah, that's that's a very clever, clever, and as as you kind of uh, admit, it's uh, fortuitous, I guess, and kind of lucky that it's kind of worked right. out that way. And you you obviously time things really, really well. Um, how how did you go with the different instruments? Uh, were you able to teach each instrument at a basic level? Yeah, you know, I was I was always playing in bands. I was the kid who band practice was always at my house, so I was always messing around on all the different instruments. And I went through different stages of my life where I'd spend a few years focusing on drums or, or, or guitar. So I felt comfortable and confident with a complete beginner or intermediate level kid on, on any of those instruments. I did not feel confident or comfortable when I was dealing with more advanced level kids. And, and I'm a bass player. So there, it's not like if I was a guitar player that would have been much more beneficial. You know, right. I mean, I'm, I maybe had two or three bass players in the school at, at the time. Yeah. So you had you were competent enough to get kids started on keys, drums, bass, and guitar. That, that were your primary rock instruments? Right. But I knew what those instruments were supposed to sound like, and I knew how to guide those kids. I just, as long as they didn't say to me, well, let me hear you play it. I was okay. <laughs> right, okay. And when they rocked up that, that first group of eight, did they? Did you say, all right, well, um, oh, sorry, first, first group of six, did you sort of go, okay, well, uh, Simon, you're on the drums and Julie, you're on the bass, or did they get to pick? How did, or did they keep swapping? Um, no, I, I, they specifically signed up. They came into the program with their instrument picked out, and then I, you know, and then if, if I didn't have an opening for drums, it was too bad. The kid, I, I would lose a student. Well, they'd go on a wait list, I guess. Right. Right. Yeah. Yep. So um, it's it's, a, it's such an interesting story. I love hearing how people start these things. And it really sounds like you didn't quite know what you were doing or what you were trying to build um, by your own admission. And look what's happened now. I had a vision. Sorry, I had a vision of what it ultimately would look like. And I just focused on that end point, even when I pitched it at the open house. Right. Great. And so uh, let's talk about the building of the, the studio. So how did you know when to hire other teachers and how did you get the right people? Um, well, look, I, I mean, first of all, I, you know, the school maxed out. I only have so much time to teach. We all do who teach. We were limited. And so as I started kind of reaching that um, full capacity point, I had some really tough questions to ask myself. Like, well, you know, do I raise my prices? What, what do I do now? And so I just started hiring people, but then I didn't have any criteria as to what I was looking for. So there was a lot of hiring and firing and trial and error. Um, and then over the years, I kind of began to um, get a sense of what my typical employee looks like in terms of um, not only musical background, but personality and, and a, a, an ability to connect and tell and tell a story, which I think for educators, your storytelling skills and your ability to connect, are, I value that more than your musical abilities. Wow. Now, that's, that's a pretty big call um, because most people would put the music ability way above anything else. 
Why yeah. is the storytelling so important? The ability to tell stories so important to you? Because when you're telling a story, you're pulling your student in to the moment. With the kids, the minute you start talking, they start zoning out. <laughs> um, and I've learned I never um, explain things to kids. I just want them to experience it and then say, okay, what you would just experienced is this thing. And then I start putting language to it. But how you present something, if there's a way to um, you know, put it in some framework of a story, especially with a group, with a group of kids, out of nowhere, a lot of the times I go, okay, who here saw the new Star Wars movie? It has nothing to do with what's happening in the class, but it's my way of pulling them in and focusing on me. A 30-second conversation about The Last Jedi, and then I transition back into music talk. Right. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of that as well as a great rapport building method with any, with any right. student. Yeah. Finding that common ground and, and having a chat about things. All right. So you uh, started hiring people. Uh, so these were teachers who could teach like you did uh, a number of kids in a room and multiple instruments to a basic level. Um, initially, I then became the band guy and they became private instructors. I gave them very little guidance. Again, I was trying to create structure within a world that lacks structure, the world of rock and roll, mm -hmm. which is a real, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a street culture. Kids just kind of learn on the fly. And there's something beautiful about that. Mm -hmm. But I figured I could speed up the process of musical development for kids. If I could give them a real framework. So I, had, I initially wrote all of my um, teaching curriculum for each instrument because I went... I remember going to Borders Books and looking for music books to teach rock and roll. They were teaching songs, but they weren't teaching the natural progression that I felt like students needed to go through. So I just started writing books for each instrument. And then, you know, it took about a year or two to get to that point. And then my teacher started teaching with that. Right. Okay. So you actually created the first curriculum material that you created was actually for instruments, individual instruments. And then right, that right. formed into what you've now got, which we'll talk about in a moment, which is your kids' rock program and subsequent programs, which is what other teachers can now use if they're interested in doing the same thing. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So, uh, well, let's uh, one one other question just about teaching. Now, now that you've got more structure around how you hire people and what you're looking for, uh, how do you go about making sure that your teachers are teaching the way that you want and that suits? your vision for the studio great question well the first before i hire somebody i ask a parent to come in to take a free lesson with this um, prospective hire and they teach them the lesson and then i have a series of questions to ask the parent and from that experience i mean and, and and by the time i've reached that point with a perspective um, instructor, they've gone through at least two or three um, in, in interviews. Right. So I really take my time with it because this teacher, this instructor, I'm going to have to like be living with this person. They're going to have to be living with me for hopefully a few years. And it's really the only time in the relationship, you know, sort of during this courtship that you can get out of it or you can not hire them. And there aren't consequences. Once you hire them, there's consequences if it doesn't work out. So I really try to be very thorough. A big thing that I do is I have my instructors observe the other teachers and they have a series of questions that they answer about the other teacher. Oh, so right. I really try my staff learning from, from each other. Like what kind of questions are they looking to answer? You know, it might be um, questions about how does the teacher structure the lesson? How do they troubleshoot problems? Are they playing most of the time? Or no, it's questions about how much time is spent playing and how much time is spent talking, talking and instructing. Yeah. yeah. And then I also say, I think, is, is there anything that the instructor does that you feel that you could incorporate into your own teaching? And that's mm. an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And so, and just going back, you actually get them to teach a lesson to a, a parent, not a child. Is that right? Correct. Why, Correct. why, not, uh, why not a child? Because a child, it would be hard, I feel, to ask. I mean, that's a great question. I feel like it would be hard to get the information that I need from a child. Because I want the, I, want, I need critical information. And 
I need the good and the bad and the ugly. And I think for a kid, that could be a lot of pressure. I see. Yeah. So it's more about uh, you're asking the person who's receiving the lesson to give you feedback. You're, it's not just about you observing how that teacher is interacting with the student and what they're right. doing. Got it. And, and I think this also brings up the bigger question of who is our real customer? Is it the parent or is it the child? And you know, there's a real challenge there. And one question I always ask the parent is, if you were looking to place your child in or another child in my studio, how, would you be okay with this person teaching your child? And that answer is pretty much what helps me make my final decision. Hmm. Yeah, a really interesting approach. I haven't heard of it done in that way before. So I'm sure people who are listening who are interested in this and who are hiring people or considering it uh, will definitely take some ideas away from that. So thanks for sharing that. Great. Sure. All right, so you started creating resources, these books uh, on specific instruments and how you think they should be taught to introduce the rock kind of style playing. Correct me if any of this is wrong. I'm just kind of summarizing. Um, and then eventually you wanted to be able to hand over your own job, I'm guessing, which is the you were the band guy. So uh, you started creating material around how you actually did that. Right, and I've learned with music instructors First of all, all of us are very passionate about music, and I have noticed that if you give music instructors too much guidance, if the framework's too tight, they can push back. So I try to give them very general, um, a very general framework, and I try to empower them and say, look, you teach your way, but be sure to hit on these points. And those points, I think any music educator would, um, would, would feel comfortable with. Mm, right. Oh, it's very much aligned with my own views on that. So when I produce materials, it's I always call it a framework rather than a method. It's uh, right, it's like okay. here's a here's a structure, a scaffold around which you can build your own teaching. Use bits of it, don't use this bit. Align it, add in stuff. You know, it's designed as a creative um, resource, I guess, for how right. you can go about doing things. So yeah, that that aligns really well with the, my own approach. So let's let's talk about your your program. It's called Kids Rock. Well, that's the first one I gather you started. Tell us what kind right. of ages it's for, what um, what it does, and what teachers might be interested in it. So um, Kids Rock is for ages four to seven, and it um, it's reversed the music education process by making rock band the first exposure to playing an instrument, as opposed to private lessons. Private lessons is the ultimate destination. And, well, how do you get a four-year-old to play in a rock band? They can't even play the guitar. Like, what are you doing? It's, it's a crazy proposition, but I made it work by, all, by making the music. All the music is written for this age group, and it's written so that they can come in day one and, and play. And it's more about building a child's sense of their own musical uh, abilities so that they feel good about themselves and that they perceive music as, as fun. And um, well, Kids Rock came about because I ultimately set an age a minimum in my studio, which created a problem for me. And I was turning away a lot of students. What was your um, age minimum? I ultimately, um, it was different for every instrument. Piano, I said five. Drums and guitar, I said seven. And um, I was torn as a business owner. Do I take that four or five-year-old right away, get money right away, but run the risk of turning them off to playing music, run the risk of them perceiving it to be too hard and too much of a challenge? You know, do I say, no, don't come to me, or do I accept that, accept that money in the moment? And I, my first decision was, okay, I'm going to just set these age minimums because I really felt like I didn't have the ability to – um, teach a five-year-old to do well on drums or guitar successfully. And I had minimal success with piano. I mean, I, I found some method books that I think were good, but I had a hard time with retention with this younger age group. I had much better retention with my nine, you know, 13-year-olds. So, the, but then, you know, the recession hit, and here I was turning away students left and right, and I said, I got to do something about this. So I let students in this age group come to me for free so I could experiment in a group setting what could be done. And I put uh, Kids Rock together during that year. 
Right. And so the 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 goal of Kids Rock is to get uh, preschool age, so ages four to seven kids, yeah. playing together in a band as their first experience of music. Right. Right. How is that possible? Well, yeah, I'm picturing a four-year-old holding a full-size guitar, and that's that's going to be way bigger than them, right? Everything. So I had to look at every component of what goes on in an ensemble setting and and bring it down to their level. So the guitar only has three strings. It's a small size guitar. Everything is in one key and everything is um, marked up with, with, with decals and colors. And they learn how to read standard notation, but it's all with colors. And they only have to learn seven notes. And everything's unison playing. And so it's very simple. It's almost shockingly simple, but it needs to be that way. Right. It's all about giving kids access to the ensemble experience, Get, letting them experience day one the end result, which is playing in a rock band in front of an uh, in front of a cheering audience. That that will change a kid's life. Yeah, and and having wins along the way, right? And quick wins too. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. So uh, I'm picturing this room. You've uh, you've got a program now where you you know how to teach these kids. Let's say four or five year olds. Uh, each of them are on a on a different instrument. They're jamming away. Are they playing music that they know, like common riffs and things? No, everything. Ha- even the, the music was written for the program. So, for example, for the four and five year olds, the chords change every two measures. And then when the chord changes, it takes kids sometimes six beats to get to that next chord. <laughs> right. So the chord change happens, and it sounds a little bit like a bit of a roller coaster. The band comes together. And then, boom, off to another chord. And then as the kids get older, the rate of chord changes picks up. And the the concept of a chorus is introduced to the music. The little kids are only playing an eight-measure pattern that that repeats. And that's the whole song. Right. And are they playing along to a backing track to kind of fill it out a bit and keep them in time? No. the, The instructor plays along either on piano or guitar. But in concert, I go to my older students and have older as in maybe nine or 10 and they help out and they play along with, with the kids. Right. So I built a little bit of mentoring. Yes. It's a, I build a band within a band. Yeah. Nice. And so I think you said that you got, you launched a beta version of this first to test it out. How did that work out? So, um, I had a local competitor who was, you know, you know, 10 miles, 15 miles away. wasn't a direct competitor friendly with the guy. And he was interested in the program and he wanted me to put one of my employees on site to teach it. And I said, you know, why don't you run the program and I'll teach you how. And I worked closely with him for about a year and just, you know, because now it's like, okay, now I got to get this thing in a box with a little pretty bow on it so that he can open it and run his own version of it. And, um, and I realized, wait, I'm maybe I'm 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 on to something here. Maybe I'm offering something that can be helpful to, to other music instructors and allow them to not only feel good about this age group, but maximize the, the, their profits by having, you know, six kids in 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 a band. And it kind of went just took off from there. And I, I started, you know, taking it nationally and then I got into Canada and then the UK. And so here we go. Fantastic. And so do teachers who are interested in this have to buy the instruments as well through you or somewhere else? How does that work? So I provide uh, uh, two guitars come with the program. I have um, an agreement with or there's a local guitar manufacturer who builds guitars for the program. And all they need is um, a junior sized drum set and any $90 keyboard will, will work for the program. Right. And so uh, I gather this is could be used by teachers as a um, an alternative to those more traditional elementary programs like Kitty Keys and Music Garden, things like that. Um, how much? So, and, and I know there might maybe teachers listening going, you know what? I, I really want to do something with preschool, but I want to do something that's a little bit different. So they may well be quite interested in this. How much of an impact has opening up this? age level with this group action and this activity had on things like your retention, 
the student's skills when they move up to the next level? And then, of course, your your bottom line. Right. Great question. So you so re, re, my retention rates have really improved dramatically at the same. Um, think of Kids Rock as like as like soccer. I'm sorry, football. We're dealing with Australia here. Think of it as like football for five year olds. Any kid can do it. Any kid can join the team. But what percentage of those kids playing football at five are going to be playing it when they're 10? OK, it's a it's a, a limited percentage. Whereas before going into private lessons, there was, a, a, I think, a, a, a significant barrier to entry. You got to buy a piano. You got to buy books. You got to do all these things. Whereas Kids Rock, any kid can do it. So the kid who's really connecting with music and is falling in love with it, not only are they going to stay in, with your program, but they're going to um, they're going to you know grow up with, with your school. So um, so you had talked about retention. What's interesting is that the kids who graduate from Kids Rock they stay with me um, for much longer than kids that are coming in at maybe eight that aren't coming from Kids Rock because the Kids Rockers do have some um, developed fine motor skills that your typical eight-year-old doesn't have. And more importantly, they, they're confident in their, their abilities because they're seven or eight and they've already played about six concerts in front of a hundred people. So they're just, music's been a part of their life for a couple of years. Mm. And then the impact on the, the bottom line, obviously it's been positive because you've opened up an area that you weren't actually catering for before. Right. I mean, now it's interesting. 20% of my revenues are coming from Kids Rock. but that So I'm getting new money today, but I would say 40 to 50% of my studio are Kids Rock graduates. So from a marketing standpoint, it's a funnel. I'm not having to spend so much on advertising. And my competitors are not interested in this age group. They don't want four-year-olds, you know, unless they're going to put them in some like kitty keys or, you know, kinder music. You know, the guitar teachers in my area, they don't want four-year-olds in guitar lessons. School of Rock doesn't want them. But I'll take, not only will I take them, I'll, I'll, I'll keep them. Right. Yeah. Well, you've, you've absolutely cornered another whole area of the market, which is obviously being underserved uh, and created something right. really special for them. So, uh, yeah, congratulations. It sounds like a great program. Well, thank you. Um, and I understand that you've now subsequently, uh, after creating that and having such success with the preschoolers, you've then realized, well, actually, now I need something for the preteens and then something for the next group. So you've actually got a series of programs now, haven't you? Right, because it came, first of all, Kids Rock created a new problem for me. Because now I've got these six and seven-year-olds loving being in a rock band. And then I was saying, okay, you're too old for Kids Rock. Go into piano lessons now. Uh, okay, but I want to be with the band. Sorry. You're like, I don't have anything for you. So I extended Kids Rock with a whole new program called Junior Rockers that takes the, the, the philosophy of day one, you're in a rock band. And what's happened for me is now if somebody calls up to my studio with an eight or nine year old and they want to take piano lessons, they, I say, look, let me tell you about junior rockers and let me tell you what this can do for your child. And then and then you pick for yourself. You, you know, do you think junior rockers is the best fit or private lessons? I'd say 80 percent go right into junior rockers and then they upgrade to private lessons. Right. So private lessons is in my studio. It's really for the kids that have convinced themselves that they want to really grow as a musician and kind of hone those skills. Yep. And it's, as you say, it's a great funnel. You, you know, you get them in the door at the start and then they can move up through the, uh, you know, the, the sequence of activities onto private lessons potentially if they want to. Um, just at the beginning uh, of their time with you in the Kids Rock program, what's the expectation with practice? None. Right. They don't think there's nothing they buy. They don't do it at home. It only happens in the class. It's let's take everything that people love about music. Let's let's maximize it and amplify it. Let's take the things that people struggle with and let's minimize those things. Practice, I think, is for people that are really hungry to grow as musicians. I do think, look, you have to practice to develop those core skills. It's just it's not going to happen if you're not doing it. 
Um, but practice is for the kid who says, okay, music is for me. And in junior rockers, that's where the practicing starts to kick in. But they're not with a private teacher yet. Now there's positive peer pressure of, I got to keep up with my band. I got to practice. They're, they're not practicing. Like when I was a kid, I had this like, like scary Russian, you know, old country uh, bass teacher. And I practiced because I was afraid of him. I didn't practice because I loved what he was teaching me. But, um, and, and there's something to be said for his, his approach. But, um, you know, it's 2018 and, I, and it's a different world. And I want, I, want to, I want kids to practice because it's taking, it's therapeutic for them. It's allowing them to take a break from the pressures of school. And um, my ultimate hope is that they'll put down their cell phone in the video game and go to the piano for, for therapeutic. Uh, uh, wouldn't that be great? Yes, absolutely. I think everyone will be nodding their heads as they listen. Um, I actually think this uh, at that young age is actually quite a clever approach because you, you mentioned football for five-year-olds before, you know, the, the analogy to sports teams. And one of the biggest differences between what we try and offer for young students and what they get in soccer and ballet and dance and karate and all those things which we're often competing with, uh, is right. that they don't have to practice any of those things. Well, maybe karate, but, you know, so they might kick a soccer ball around, but really all the action happens when they're at their training and maybe they actually have three of those a week or two of them, whatever it is. So you've almost taken a leaf out of sport in that regard and created a program where kids come and do it when they're there and then they come back the next week and they do it some more and they have fun, they enjoy it. Maybe they'll go and tinker on the weekend, they'll kick a soccer ball around with their family or something like that. And then they start live, loving it, enjoying it and start thinking, well, maybe maybe I could learn a bit more about this. And that's where the private lessons come in. You're, you're, well, let's, take it, let's go back to your, your football analogy. What if your kid's really thriving on the football team and really is getting serious about it? Okay, you might get that kid a private coach to start working on fine tuning those skills. And that's what our exactly what our, our approach is. Private lessons are about mentorship and, and fine tuning and making significant growth. None of that can happen until the, the kid believes that they have musical abilities and, and that they love it. And I, I want to say one more thing about um, the football analogy. If you have two boys live, that are next door neighbors, and they're on the same football team. And one boy is back there every day kicking the ball in the backyard against the wall. And another boy isn't ever doing it. Both parents will keep their kids on the team. The, the, the parent with the child who isn't practicing, the parent won't say, well, you know, he's not practicing in the backyard like my neighbor. Therefore, I'm pulling him out of the team. Just today, I had a parent say to me, I'm pulling my girls out of lessons because they don't practice. And that I think I'm determined to fix that. Mm. You know, it's like I don't think not not practicing is not a, an excuse to pull your kid out of music. Mm. Uh, interesting. I mean, we could go down the uh, old practice discussion rabbit hole uh, very quickly. So I want to. I'm going to keep moving uh, because I have a feeling there will be some people listening out there who um, potentially have created some of their own products and uh, ideas around teaching, and maybe they would be interested in doing what you've done and packaging it up, putting that bow on it, as you say, and licensing it or to other people or selling it. But have you got any advice to teachers who would be interested in this idea? The, the first thing. I think anyone needs to do if they're thinking of branching branching out is running their program or taking their product that they've developed and have someone else teach it because they ultimately need to remove themselves 100% out of the equation. But there's so many th details that they're not going to be able to think of just on their own. They got to get a teacher in there and watch the teacher struggle and, and then realize I haven't articulated that for them. I need to map that out. Next step is to find somebody out of your location, maybe a competitor or a friend in a different city to run the program. And you know what, maybe give it to them for free and just work with them. And, and I think the key thing is to identify what is it that needs to be mapped out. It has nothing to do with the musical component because you've already, you've already done the hard work and developed the musical component. Now you've got to, articulate how to teach this thing and my operations manual is 
it's to a point now where it's all like a script. Somebody could read it as a script. Nobody ever teaches that way, but it's just trying to come up with every potential teaching scenario that come comes up and and anticipate it and and give your your partners the tools to succeed with your program. Mm, great advice. And how does your licensing system work if, if teachers are interested in this program? So the way it works is it, it's a monthly um, it's like a monthly subscription. They they commit for a year. I give them um, an operations manual. I give them song books, re- recordings, training videos, and audio. It's everything that they need to do to succeed. And more importantly, I give them my cell phone number so they can call me when they have problems because their pro- their problems are going to and my solutions I help them come up with are going to go into my operations manual. You know, so I'm always learning from from my my licensees, um, but it really allows them to get my program and just you know kind of come out of the box with it with 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 everything work, working because I want them to focus on on their business and not focused on trying to develop you know their own program which is going to take year, years to do right you know for a, a month for a low monthly subscription it, it, it's worth it to to license license a program um, if someone came to me with my program five years ago I would have licensed it. In, in a heartbeat because right. it would have it would have solved for me a problem that I really need solved mm. and look I, I want people listening to uh, to really take note of what Dave has said because it's something we can all learn from this this idea that we we feel like we have to do every single thing in our studios particularly as we grow and get bigger and bigger and particularly if you've hired other other teachers to help you you should not be doing every single thing unless you are a graphic designer and you have time for it don't be designing every image and every logo um, unless you are a specialist in Facebook advertising, then, um, you know, by all means, give it a shot, learn how it works, but uh, maybe hiring someone is a better way to go. You've got to make sure that the cost versus the benefit of what you're doing uh, with your time is going to be giving you the most benefit. Uh, and so I'm, I'm right right with you there, Dave, um, when it comes to these kinds of things, you know, and don't, don't reinvent the wheel if, if there's something out there. Yes, you might be uh, spending some money, but uh, you're going to be saving a whole lot of time and hassle potentially with something that you know is guaranteed that will work, whereas maybe your other idea has no guarantee. So that's my thinking on it anyway. I think that's that's great. That's really great. So, Dave, thank you so much for your time today. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to mention in regard to what you've been able to achieve or your programs? No, I, I, I think the thing that I always want to in, in encourage people to do is for their own studios is, is to identify how they can maximize their growth. And what you're saying about time is, is, is so crucial. I think so many studio owners and instructors get bogged down in not um, using their time well. And, um, and my programs are really designed to help them with that. Um, um, Next year I'm coming out with a summer camp that combines um, all of my programs together. And I know summer camp's a hot issue. Surviving in the summer, at least here in the States, is is a real challenge. And summer camp has been my key to to survival. Mm. We've done, I've had a lot of interviews with people about summer camps and we've we've had uh, quite a few articles written about it. Uh, So great to know that you've you've got um, something on offer there too, or will have. So if that's of interest to you, uh, then uh, look Dave up. So you can find out more about Dave's own music school, his music studio at dsrockschool.com. And uh, there's more about Dave Simon himself and his licensing and his programs at davesimonsmusic.com, davesimonsmusic.com. Uh, he's got a blog and lots of articles for teachers looking to expand their businesses. Uh, I really like what you, uh, you've done over there, Dave. Um, So, yeah, thank you very much for your time today uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to meet one day properly in person. Yeah, Yeah. and if we meet, it's going to be in Australia for sure. All right. (laughs) You're welcome down under any time, mate. Um, Great to to hang out with you and keep up the fantastic work you're doing. Great, thanks. Same to you. Keep it it strong. See ya. All right, bye-bye.
Well, everyone, I do hope you enjoyed my interview with Dave Simon. A few reminders for you. Uh, Music Expo in London is on this time in two weeks. It's on the 22nd and 23rd of January. It's a completely free event for music and drama teachers in London. It's at London Olympia. So I'm actually going to be speaking at that event on the Friday at 10.15 in the Rock, Pop and Tech Theatre. It's going to be pretty cool. Uh, We're talking about four-chord pop composing, a creative music lesson for millennials. That's the official title. It's 45 minutes worth and uh, interestingly enough, it's going to be the first time I've presented in a theatre with headsets on. So it's because it's in a kind of semi-open space in the expo room, uh, everyone's going to have headsets on. I'm going to have a headset on and that's how you're going to hear what uh, what I'm playing and what I'm talking about. It's going to be <laughs> really interesting. I'm looking forward to it. So that's on the 22nd, 23rd of February. I do hope that if you're in London, you make some time to come along to that. And if you do, of course, make sure you come and uh, say hi after my event or at some stage anyway. And uh, as you are a podcast listener and many of you are my Inner Circle members, then make sure you find out about the meetup. We're going to have some meetup drinks at a fantastic bar called The Anthologist on the Monday night before the event. Uh, To find out more about that, head to timtopham.com slash meetup. Next week in episode two of season one, we've got the first of our 2018 composer spotlights with a person you'll know well uh, and who is also new to the podcast. We'll be discussing what he calls the crisis in creativity. We'll have a chat about whether competitions are good for composition students and the difference between improvising and composing and how you can encourage both of these pursuits in your students in just about every lesson. That's next week, but for now, I'm Tim Topham, and this is the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.